Hi, I'm Lizzie Harper from lizzieharper.co.uk and today I thought we'd do a quick video, well, quick compared to some of my other ones, showing you how I'd go about painting this cow parsley, Anthriscus sylvestris. Um, so I've drawn up the pencil drawing using reference um, from the actual plants and also photo reference. And I've also mixed up the green for the first leaves. This is a uh, Windsor Newton watercolour and it's a mix of sap green, cobalt green um, and cadmium yellow dark all mixed up to that kind of consistency. Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to start towards the top of the plant. So this is a habit sketch. It isn't a detailed botanical illustration. It's more to give a feel of what the plant looks like so that it's a whole plant. So this is part of a larger commission for an organisation in Iceland where these plants, cow parsley, are considered um, pernicious and invasive, which I find really interesting. So here we are in the UK and we're very used to cow parsley. It's sort of a, a, a part of spring, a harbinger of the summer coming when the Hedgerows become frothy with cow parsley. It's sort of beautiful. But yeah, looking at the photos in Iceland, massive swathes of countryside are literally all the land is covered with the, the basal rosette leaves of this flower. And it's out competing all sorts of native flora. Just goes to show that if we as humans keep moving plants around, then the plants are going to survive if they can. And then the problem becomes our problem isn't it? Um, anyway, by the by, so there's going to be, there's a whole sheet of botanical illustrations and details of this plant, um, which I'll show you at some point. And then this one, this little drawing, is just kind of to be like, oh, you know what plant she's talking about. It's the cow parsley. It's the one that looks like this, if you look at the whole plant. So cow parsley are members of what used to be called the umbellifera which made sense because each of these flowering heads is a little like an umbrella um at least that's how i used to remember it for myself but now they've renamed whoops renamed the um they've reclassified them as members of the apaca so all of these all of these umbellifers are now APACAs. So, and there you can tell them because they've got these normally white flowering heads which kind of branch out. And then they've often got these um, divided or pinnate, is another word for divided, these pinnate leaves. So actually drawing them, doing pencil drawings of these is very, very difficult because there's some real issues with scale because you've got to get the whole plant into your picture and you've got these tiny flowers up at the top and then you've got um, you've got the entire plant which is quite tall and the leaves are also very big so trying to sort that out can be quite a headache but once you've done that it's all all right so I'm going to zoom in now to give you a whoops hopefully without um, dropping the phone See if we can do that. Zoom out a little bit if I can. Um, so all I'm doing now is using my brush to go over the pencil lines that I've already done. However, when you're doing this, it is important, if it's in any way possible, to have your reference to hand, either the photo reference or actual reference of the plant. Because every time that you draw something or paint something you're actually drawing it you're using your you're using your paint um, as a way of drawing it so I'm now going to move the illustration up so that we can get at the next leaves which are a little further down so this is quite I mean this is really quite enlarged I mean you can tell by the tip of the brush how enlarged it is so really all I'm doing for these leaves is very simply just outlining them in green 
not really putting any body colour in at all. I'm just going over my pencil lines with the point of my brush. Just like this. And you have to make sure that you're, when you're painting, make sure the bristles are going the direction. Make sure that you're using the brush so the bristles are going the direction you don't want to push against the brush. You want you want to feel that it'll feel natural. If you push against the direction of the bristles, <clears throat> then you get a messy old line. And it just doesn't really work out right. So you just try and do that. And get in as much detail as you can. Steady hand is always useful. Well, steady hand is always useful, to be fair. Just um, push the illustration up again <clears throat> for the next bit. So this is just more of the same. So I'm just going to keep going with this. And you can see what I'm doing, really. Just outlining the pencil on these leaves. The risk here is to make sure I don't make this green too dark because in fact the greens of cow parsley are quite kind of fresh and bright. So although I definitely want it to be quite a, a serious sort of bulky green so to speak, I want it to show up, I don't want it to be wishy-washy, but at the same time I don't want it to swallow up the green and make it look heavy because that's not what this plant does. You see here I've drawn in some of the flowers as well, so I'm trying to figure out what's flower and what's leaf. And since I did this drawing about a week ago, you have to then wait for the client's feedback to say, yes, that's right, or no, that's not right. And in that time, you kind of forget what you've done to a certain extent. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to do this across the whole plant. Just outlining these leaves, literally the outline of the leaf the middle vein in a kind of darkish green, the very tip of the brush. Um, and then I'll come back to you and show you what to do next. Just going to bring you back in for a second, even though I'm still outlining my leaves. Um, but can you see how all of these are all sort of clustered one on top of the other? So if I all if I used exactly the same shade of green on all of them, they'd get lost. So for this middle bit, I'm going to mix up. Um, I'm just going to mix up slightly brighter greens, and I'm doing this by adding. Uh, can you see? Yes, you can. If I do that, so that's cadmium yellow light. So I'm adding that in to lighten the green. So it's still spring-like. It's still green, but it's that much brighter. And then you have to decide which leaves to do this for. So I'm just these these central two and then more of the same so again I'm going to keep going with my outlining and then once I've done this these bright leaves I'll um I'll have to have a little think about how to make this one look different from the leaves behind it um I've now outlined all the different leaves and now I'm going to put a top mix on and I've mixed up that's a basil rosette which sorry you can't hear me properly I've got my tip my um, paintbrush in my mouth so that's not finished yet but I'm waiting for it to dry but so here I've mixed up what I'm going to do for the color of the leaves so can you see it's much more watery than the last paint I mixed um, and it's made from a mixture of all the greens that I did use to outline the the leaves of the cow parsley and I've also added a um, added a drop of Dr. Martin's Hydra's Fine Art Watercolour Ink, Hansy Yellow Light, which gives it an extra kind of kick. I want it to be quite a trans transparent top wash. So I'm literally loading up that paintbrush with really watery paint. I mean, see how wet it is. And making sure it remains wet like that. Just filling in the white spaces left from where I outlined the leaves. 
And what happens with watercolour is that when it dries, it if, if it's sort of quite wet, it will it will dry with a kind of edge to it, edge to where the edge of the watercolour sits where the pigment will be a little bit darker and this will help with the outlining of the leaves so can you see I'm not kind of putting flat washes over whole areas I really am picking out each individual leaf part in the hope that that will help keep the illustration nice and crisp because that is the aim so going across here Cow parsley is one of the earliest of these umbellifer plants to flower. And in fact, I drew up this um, cow parsley about a week and a half ago. And then this morning when I went out to gather some leaves to work from as I added the colour, because the client has said, yes, the illustrations are OK. Um, all the flowers had gone over. There was only seed heads. And in fact, weirdly, the um, the leaves had kind of disappeared. A lot of them have gone red. It's been quite warm here. So often if a leaf goes red, it's um, it's a response to heat pressure or to, or to difficult environmental conditions. The red pigment is produced at, by the plant as a way to... Um, to cover and to shield and to protect the green pigment, of course, which is chlorophyll, which as we know, is what the plant needs to photosynthesize. So often if you see red leaves, not always, but often if you see red leaves, it's the sign of a plant that's in a certain amount of, under a certain amount of environmental pressure. So you might see them in hot climates. Okay, so here we are, we're doing, doing this. So yeah, so getting a leaf that was still green was difficult. A lot of them were all beaten up. I'll tell you what I'm doing here in just a second. Um, and the flowers, there were no flowers at all. They'd all been and gone. And in fact, the next species in the in the temporal kind of, the temporal parade, so the next ones, that the next umbe umbellifers that come up, they're all coming on strong, all the hogweeds and the, and the sort of thicker, less elegant, umbellifers with fleshier leaves all of them were thrusting up in the um in the uh, along the lane where i'd picked my initial cow parsley which i'm sure if any of you do illustration regularly or draw flowers regularly you will know how fast flowers can go over which is why it's really important to either have really good written notebook sketches and drawn sketches to show you all the information that you might not be able to get your hands on a few weeks down the line. Um, or if you can't do that, then do at least make sure that you take a lot of decent photos. So what I'm doing now is I'm using the same green on all the similarly coloured leaves. Make sure that I leave space here because these fluffy bits here are the flowering heads. Literally just applying it to each individual leaf section. Mm. It's got lots of lovely colloquial names this has. I think I think cow parsley is the one that's also known as Queen Anne's lace, which is pretty. And it is um it's very delicate actually compared to a lot of these umbellifers it's a very delicate plant now i've just done something stupid which you can see that i just did so i just put wet over here and that wasn't very clever because now if i was to paint here i would be leaning in the wet paint and i would smudge it so unlike me try and always consider where you're going to be leaning your hand and try very hard not to set yourself up to smudge your paint. As I say, I've just set myself up to smudge my paint, but hopefully because I'm aware of it, 
I won't do it. So really, you can see I'm just putting, I really I'm just putting colour in these leaf outlines. That's all I'm doing. And then letting it dry. And it's a bit fiddly because some of the areas are quite small. You see up here now, let me pull the page down so you can actually see the bit I'm working on. Now normally when I make these films, I either manage to get my hair under the camera, or if I don't get the hair under the camera, I manage to get the plant that I'm drawing under the camera. Um, or the autofocus doesn't work, so no doubt something will be going wrong on this film as well. So even though I don't yet know what it is because I haven't watched the film back, I apologise in advance for it. Right, uh, these leaves, can you see, you remember how I said that this was this one here was going to be a little bit yellower and I added the yellow. This one here I added a little bit of blue, this one, again for distinction. So I'm going to, the top wash of that one I think I'm going to do in a slightly different shade of green. These are all that one. Oh, fine. It's all right. It doesn't really jump out at you then. Um, okay, so do you remember here I left, I said, oh, I'll show you what I'm doing here and left half of those. So these are more or less dry now. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to add a little bit of tonality to those leaves. So I'm going to do that by making, using the same green that we used before, but I'm adding a bit of yellow. This time just to give it a bit of a lift and again making sure it's nice and watery and it might work might not never really know till you try it but hopefully if we do this it will make it look a little bit like there is some play of light and dark on those leaves adds a bit of sort of tonal variation yeah i think you can hopefully you can see that i'm not sure how um accurate the recording of colour is. And again, I'm going to do the same up here. Add a bit of that yellower wash. Uh, and here as well. Why not? It needs to be coloured in. A tiny touch over here and up here as well. Clearly decided that that needed to be slightly different green. Okay, haven't decided what to do about that yet, have I? You can tell that I haven't decided what to do about that yet. Yeah, okay, and then here, let's just make this a much brighter green leaf. I might even, do you remember what I was just saying about the red leaves? I might even add a little bit of maroon on the edging of this one to suggest that it's been stressed by dryness. Uh, but this main one here, I'm going to use our same green, which as you see is greener rather than the yellow shade. I'm going to use the green on that one. Having put in the yellows, that makes sense to me as a decision. Again, just plotting in those, keeping it nice and wet so it gives us those lovely edges. And if you were to paint something like this, I would suggest you work on something slightly larger. Working at this scale is not particularly easy and unless you're doing something for a specific purpose as in this case I am um, it's also totally unnecessary that's no good look at that can't tell what's going on at all that's all right doesn't matter because I'm going to come back in and sort it out with a dark there we go so I'm going to use that same green all along the right hand side of these bluer leaves and then I think I might use my yellower green once that's dry on the opposite side. So make sure all the bits of white are covered. If they need to be covered, not quite sure what's happening there. Okay. So I'm going to see if I can zoom out. Zooming out doesn't seem to be that easy, actually. So 
sorry. Okay, so you can see it's coming along very slowly, but it is coming along. So the next thing that I'm going to work on is the flowering stems up here, and they are super duper easy. So if we zone in again, let's go up to the top flowering head. Sorry, it's all shaking everywhere now. Okay. So for these, it really is just a matter of outlining and filling in. So again, I'm using the same green colour that's drying on the leaves, but I'm going to add a little bit of yellow ochre. bit more and a little bit of Naples yellow so it's a slightly browner green and now this really is very easy making sure that your leaves are dry don't, don't make that mistake and let it all bleed in and using your brush just literally outline the stem with the edge of your brush a bit fiddly but easy enough to do if you've got a steady hand and if you, oh dear, that's no good. And if you can, keep the brush stroke, oh, that's annoying. Didn't want that to fill up like that. If you can, keep the brush stroke lighter on the left-hand side of the stem than on the right-hand side. Because if you can do that, that will suggest that there's some shadow coming in. So there we go, there's the light line on the right. And again, just tiniest of lines. to show whether branches are separating out to support each different part of the flowering head. This really is rather a small canvas. I'm not gonna, even going to try and do what I mentioned just then of trying to have lights and darks. I just need to get those stems in to be fair. It's very small. But can you see up at the top where they anchor into the flowers and down the bottom where they come out of the junction with the leaves? You can add a little bit more tonality. Make it slightly heavier. There we are. So this is one of three invasive plants I'm illustrating for this client in Iceland. And it's very interesting. So one is this, which to me is an extremely familiar plant. I mean, it is cow parsley, early June, the UK, every path, every roadside. I think probably across the whole of Britain. I mean, I don't know how far north it goes, but it certainly goes all the way down the coast just ubiquitous it's absolutely everywhere and often actually if you're lucky you'll have the cow parsley and the hawthorn or the which is also known as hawthorn blossom is known as may so you'll have the hawthorn and the um cow parsley at the same time so the cow parsley fills the hedges with this froth of blossom and the hawthorn blossom the may arches down from the hedgerows to meet it from above and you've got this kind of ridiculous excess of white fluffy flowers alive with kind of bees and flies and pollinators. It's very, very lovely. Anyway, but isn't it weird to think that in Iceland it's really problematic? So this is one of the one of the problem plants for them. Oh, whoops. Um another is something called the uh, Nutka lupin? I haven't got my sheet of paper nearby. It's also known as the Alaskan lupin, which is a very pretty blue-purple flower. And yeah, the photos, I mean, as far as the eye can see across the black volcanic soil of Iceland, you've got these beautiful fields, almost, vistas of blue lupins. 
and they're not well you know they're, they're problematic because with all these things with it, when botanists talk about invasive plants or when ecologists talk about invasive plants the problem is that if they're incredibly successful and don't have any natural habitat uh, natural habitat yeah. natural predators then they outcompete um they outcompete the native species which don't get enough sunlight don't get enough ground and of course that is not great not least because the native species will have evolved with all sorts of insect and animals they will have co-evolved to support each other in ecological webs and if suddenly the plant can't do what it's meant to do if it can't flower or produce seeds or whatever then not only is it bad for that native plant but it is also bad for the species that coexist with that plant however what i do think is super important is to not be aggressive towards these quote-unquote invasive plants i know i bang on about this quite a lot but the language of invasive plants i find quite problematic it sounds oh hello little beetle be really careful with things like that <sighs> i'm trying to blow it out the way be really careful with that because if you crush them first it's not very kind but second it also is very difficult to get the smear off your page there we go so i've lifted him up on the tip of my paintbrush and i'm going to put him back with my cow parsley specimens in the jug so he can go on to live another day um yeah but i mean the only reason why these invasive plants are here or why they shouldn't be is because we as humans have moved them there i mean in the old days yeah colonization of new habitats did happen it was often oh seeds that came in on the feet of birds or something would wash up on a shore somewhere but the whole scale problems is to do with us having imported plants and the victorians were particularly prone to this plants sort of for ornamental gardens and things um so yeah and you really instead of knocking the plants for growing where they've been put you should say wow that is amazing that is nature in action these plants making the most of their new habitat and exploiting it and just literally going wow i ain't got no predators i'm gonna i'm actually gonna take over here and who can blame them you know okay so here we're literally i don't know what that is what's that meant to be shouldn't be that just following the lines lit i mean we are a lot what we're doing here it's just going over lines that already exist and here on these slightly thicker bits of them, the stem, what I was saying about keeping it darker on the right hand side, lighter on the left hand side, that does apply. And you can already see without it even having the top wash on, you can already see that it gives it a certain, oh, I was going to say grace, but I think I flatter myself by saying that. Mm, oh gosh, we're all in a tangle here. It's all right, I'm going to use some dark colours to untangle us. And can you see here I've drawn the, the stem with ridges and a slight swelling down here. And that is because, surprise, surprise, the stem is ridged with slight swelling. Ha <laughs> ha! Um, but yeah, that needs to be included. And here, these are the branches holding the leaves. Plop them in, plop them in. where the illustration is large enough try and do the dark on the right side lighter lines on the left side and you see because this is a habit illustration it has everything so it's also got the root on I'll do the root in a minute Where are we? i've got to make sure that all this is still under the camera hopefully it is for now and again, just a little line following out the, is it called the rashies? It might be called the rashies. But anyway, the um, the stalk, the petiole, I guess, of the leaves. And can you see what I was saying about the way these paints dry? So they've dried and they're sort of slightly, they're slightly crisp. The edges are, which is beautiful. 
an effect I really like. And of course, what we're going to do when we're done with this is we're going to rub out the pencil, which amazingly and wonderfully, um, pencil will rub out even when you're watercoloured on top of it. Now, that does depend slightly on the paper. The paper I'm currently using is Fluid 100, is its name. It's made by Global Arts. And it's got a very smooth surface. It's hot press watercolour paper, which if you're doing botanical illustration, you really need hot press. Because even though cold press, cold press has that kind of bumpy surface, which is very beautiful. But it's very hard to get a crisp line. Um, so generally, botanical illustrators avoid cold press paper. So this is hot press, but then there are hot presses and hot presses. So there'll be some people who will say, oh my gosh, I can't believe you use that paper. That's horrible. And there'll be other people who say, oh yeah. Fluid 100, that's the best paper there is. So, as with all our equipment, there's a certain amount of personal preference involved. Oh, and the third plant, I knew I was meant to be concentrating on something else. The third plant that they want for this Icelandic Invasives Commission is a moss. The, um, the Heath Star Moss, which, thanks to a, a very, very kind local um local botanist i have a specimen of he's very kind to send me his specimen and so i know that i'm drawing the right thing because i am rubbish at um mosses very bad at them right seed heads again more of the same this is all the same technique i wish i hadn't drawn this quite so small i'm slightly annoyed with myself because it does make my life rather difficult at this point but here I'm just literally outlining them. Just have to give an impression of what the plant looks like. So that the idea with these habit sketches is you look at them and you're like, oh my gosh, I know exactly what that plant is. I walk past it. I never knew that was a cow parsley. Oh, look, that's what the root does underground. Ah, when it comes into flower, it does this. Oh, it holds its seed heads like that. So all of that information, without necessarily the biological detail, all that information is meant to be combined in this one picture. Now, can you see also with the flowers how a lot of them are kind of against the stem and things. Although they do do that in real life, this is one of the tricks that I mentioned on a recent film about painting white flowers. If you can make sure that your white flowers, I don't know what that is, that doesn't look like a bit of flower. I'm gonna knock it back a bit. Um, if you can make sure that your white flowers are against um, a leafy background, then you don't need to worry so much about how you're going to depict them. Okay. Uh, right, so now I'm going to put the top wash on the stem, which is, do you remember that yellowish mix that we had? The one that I made here. Um, so it's just the same one, but it's, same mix but really watery so let me just do that and i'm gonna to have to take a break so i've just been summoned for lunch literally one line with that watery top wash and there and then down to there not on the root because the root of course is not green the root does not photosynthesize it couldn't even if it wanted to because it does not have access to the sunshine because it's underground up there any of these places where i've done the double lines need this top wash and it's very hard when you're doing these straight lines very hard to breathe you have to breathe but i tend not to um a good trick if you are trying to paint a straight line oh i've gone off camera again sorry a good trick is to look where you're going rather than at the tip of your brush and then just follow the line down okay so i'm going to pause for a bit um 
but I'll be back to pick out your lights and darks and deal with the flowers in a minute or two. So you can see we've got all the stems in, not the roots yet, and now we just need to deal with the flowers and then pick out the darks and deal with the roots. So I'm zooming in on the flowers. At least I'm trying to. There we go, that'll do. Um, let's start with the top ones, working from the top down. So I've mixed up a blue, a mucky blue. It's cerulean, which is over here, mixed in with cobalt blue, which is there, with, you guessed it, a lot of water. And what we don't want is for these flowers to look like they're blue, because they are not, they are white. So the blue is literally just going to be applied in tiny areas as a suggestion of shadow. Now, what I'm going to do with these is when I'm done with the illustration, I'm not going to rub out the pencil lines of the flowers. I'm going to allow those to stand. There are different different approaches that you can take to um, white flowers. And if you check out my video on painting a white cherry blossom, which is also on YouTube, you'll be able to see some of them. But certainly just leaving a pencil line is certainly uh, one way of doing it. But you don't just want them totally flat because they, they cast shadows, right? They're, you know, anything which is three-dimensional, in theory, casts a shadow. And that's what these little flowers are going to be doing. But I don't want you to look at the flowers and be like, oh yeah, look at that lovely blue umbellifer. It's like, no, the flowers are white. You've got to have the blue there to suggest the depth of shadow without allowing it to swallow up the entire plant and you also you don't want to you know you want the lines to be quite kind of broken in the way that shadow is shadow isn't just look big flat slabs of color and so it doesn't appear as such on flowers either it would be useful at this point in time if some of the cow parsley flowers were still in flower but i know that to find one in flower, I would have to take my bike and cycle to a much higher altitude and then bring the flower home, clutched between my teeth, perhaps. Um, yes, yeah, basically it would be a pain. And I've got my photo reference and my written notes, so I know what I'm doing, more or less. So it's a nice, a nice stage to be at. Look at that, totally not done any of those stems. That's rubbish. No. Somebody wasn't concentrating. There's another tractor. Blue. So this is very much just one one element of the whole sheet and when I'm done with this illustration I will show you guys the the sheet which I did from an entire plant and for that I am um, I put the plant out of doors because it's a large plant more than a meter tall um, I put it out of doors and pinned up a sheet a white sheet so I could see what was going on so I cut the background out and Pinned it up against the climbing frame, not the climbing frame, the trampoline in the garden. Um, and I got a little stool out in the sun and drew it from life, which was quite difficult to do, but it was actually a lovely way to spend time. And I don't get to do that as often as I'd like. So I was quite pleased that the day gave me that. Okay, so we're doing this more. This literally, can you see the tiny little... Just tiny little blue brush marks. They don't look like they're up to much, but they just give a little bit of a little bit of something to the flowers. Let's make it a bit prettier. And in fact, cow parsley is a plant that I've illustrated loads before. Um, 
so you might think, oh, well, you've illustrated this plant over and over, you must be bored senses of it. And with some plants, that's true, but actually, I don't feel that way with cow parsley. I, I, I still, <laughs> no matter how many times I draw it, I still think, yeah, I still have to sort of do it justice. I haven't quite nailed that, that height plus that delicacy. I'm nearly there with those flowers. Down here is a bit mucky because it looks like I drew the flowers and then rubbed them out and changed my mind. So that's annoying, but never mind. Okay, so those flowers are done. And now I'm going to start working into the darks. So I tend to use a purple, a purplish blue to work into the darks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use some of this, which is cobalt blue. And I'm going to mix it into our existing bright green. Oh, I've just realised we still need to use a bit of that bright green for those flower stems. No, I'll leave it on that side. So that's quite a dark green and now I'm going to mix in purple as well just which you can't see it's just off screen there so you can see we've got quite a dark I didn't want to just use black I never use black for my shadows because black can be quite a it's a harsh color but it's also not particularly interesting whereas this which is a kind of dark khaki greenish is much more interesting okay so I'm now going to look to see where the darks are going to be. Hopefully I'm not going to mess this up. That would be embarrassing. So they're going to be where things overlap, basically. That's your the logic. Apply logic to what you're doing. And you'll find you're more likely to succeed. Again, I'm also adding, making sure that there's some behind the flowers. Because by putting dark behind the flowers, it will push the flowers visually to the front, which is quite a nice thing to do. Uh, what's happening here? So, And also you need to remember what your light source is. Traditionally, in botanical illustration, your light source comes from the top left corner. So remember that as you're painting. go that's right and a tiny little spot of dark under each of the flowering seeds anchor them down literally you can almost use the painting that you've already done as a guide where are your darks where already are your dark sitting well then use those exploit that that you've already done and just emphasise them with the extra dark paint. And to make sure that as I work over the illustration, I keep the painting in view on the camera. Don't want to leave you in the lurch. It's going to be casting a shadow, isn't it? Again, cutting into the spaces between the leaves now concentrate and again where each stem hits the flowers there would be a shadow cast by the froth of oh that was rubbish by the froth of flowers um i haven't got any clean tissue that's bad you should always have clean tissue on hand for when you're messing up block hope for the best right um further up here so we're just going all over, literally, picking out those darkest darks where they're relevant and trying to, by do that, doing that, trying to throw some depth into the illustration. Because the colours are there and the shape is there, all of that's there, but it just doesn't feel, it feels rather flat right now and I don't want it to feel flat. I'd like it to feel a little more lively. Wow, didn't want to do that. Well, that's going to have to be a part of that leaf. That's right. Save the day, save the day. Emergency. And this is coming off here. Still on camera. Still with me. Sticking with me. Thank you. 
And all the way up here, you're not. Hang on. And can you see these are literally just tiny, tiny spots of this darker pane? That's all it is. Very, very simple. You just need to try and judge carefully where to apply them and where not to apply them. So which of these is behind the other one? I think this flowering stem is behind the other stem. So that stem would be pos shining a shadow on, casting a shadow. And from on this side. Leaf tips. Leaf tips tend to be darker. That's quite a reliable rule of thumb. Pick them out. Literally picking out all these darks. I don't know if you can see on this scale, but when I zoom out, you'll see that it does. It does help. Oh, I keep going off camera. Sorry, guys. And keep an eye on the tip of your brush as well, because sometimes, even as you're painting, the tip of the brush, the brush, the bristles might start to splay or go in different directions and you really don't need that so make sure that you know what's going on with your brush at all times that's a mess isn't it look at that that's terrible i have to come back with some white gouache on that it's no good at all harper uh where have we gone where haven't we gone it should be evident and indeed it is evident over here we need to pick out our darks <laughs> it's almost like miniature painting rather than botanical illustration, isn't it? Okay. Leaf tips under the flowers, where the shadows are. It's no good either, that doesn't look clear enough. Under the seed heads. Down in here, we've got quite a lot of shadow going on. So where each leaflet attaches to the stem, have a tiny spot of dark. Any places where they're overlapping each other, tiny spot of dark. And the leaf tips where relevant, tiny spot of dark. Uh, yes, you are still on camera. Maybe if I did that, that would help. There we go. So hopefully that will, it's an awful term, isn't it? Pop. But hopefully that will make those flowers pop. That's what designers say, don't they? If we put this red flower in, it's going to make the whole composition pop. This is, we knew this bit here was going to be complicated, didn't we? And indeed it is. The stem is very straightforward. Let's pick out those darks. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. That's a little better. Need a bit more dark in there. That's more like it. Sometimes you just don't even really know what you're doing. You're just kind of mucking about and hoping that it works. What I would say is remember not to go too dark too fast. You can always add darks. But you can't take them away very easily. So if you think, oh, maybe not, then wait, you know, come back to it. Bearing in mind what's in front of what, what's casting shadows where. Put a bit of shadow on it. Again, here we go with the leaf tips, remember? And where it joins, leaf tip, where it joins. Whoops. Rumbling tummy. 
this bit is overlapped so again there's a bit of shadow there don't want to make it too much an area of focus though now what's happening over here you see over here yes you're still on camera good ah that was a rubbish line why did i do that never mind save the day save the day work it through work it through don't panic So I'm, un I'm underlining this because I think that's structurally quite important. It um, will help the eye realise that these leaves are all attached to the same stem. Making it less dark. Hopefully this is in some way useful. I mean, this is, I know this is this simplistic habit sketch, but these techniques that I'm using are exactly the same as I'd be using on a, on a sort of more polished piece, picking out your darks, trying to make it slightly more lively, slightly more full of shade and light, because that's what makes things look lively. Mm, it's all right. Still a bit mucky. What's happening here? That's the that's the pig. I don't know what's happening here. Let's make a big decision. Let's just do that and hope for the best. Ah, that was rubbish. Well, I'll fix that in a minute. Haven't done this yet, have we? Getting there. Where are you going on here? Let's try and make that slightly more clear. Okay, that's better. Let's cast in a shadow, make sure those shadows are clear. It takes quite a long time, this, and it really is quite fiddly. It's kind of mucking about. But it's worth doing because ultimately. You end up with something that you're pleased with, hopefully. Um, okay, where were those stems that I didn't even put in? Oh, flip, I've lost them. Oh, this is a mess, isn't it? Look how thick this is. I'll show you what I'm going to do about that. I'm going to get some white gouache, making sure it's super white. As in, when I say super white, that's not the colour. The colour is called permanent white. But I don't want it to be mixed in with any other colour. There it is, literally, whoops, tiny bit from the top of the tube. Put the lid back on, don't want it to dry out. And trim the edge of that line of the white paint. That's a damn sight more elegant. That's better. And then come in with your lights and darks again so nobody will ever know. Uh, right, so there's some seed head that need a tiny bit of touch, tiny touch of colour on top of them. There's some more up here, some here. There's the stem that I didn't do. You can just plot it in like that. Looks all right now, that one does. Okay, now for the root. Easy peasy the root is. So yellow ochre, plus a touch of brown, any old brown. So what we're mixing, we're mixing a kind of beigey, beigey brownie colour. So 
same thing we're, we're outlining the pencil lines that we've already done the hard work with illustration well at least for me the hard work is the drawing it up in the first place once you've got that covered a lot of the rest of it really is just coloring in i mean you know if i was to be completely honest people say oh what do you do for a living oh i'm an illustrator oh, da, 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 da. actually no what do i do for a living i'm just really good at coloring in that's all got quite good at it over the years okay so these are just little root hairs that we're going to add in okay i'm keeping the shadow do you remember again we're keeping the shadow darker on the right hand side nearly there everyone these little dents which either come from obstacles in the soil or little growth ridges but they just make the root look a bit more realistic and then this line here And then once that roots dry, put a very pale top wash. So this is literally that brown, plus a lot of water, plus um, Naples yellow. Whoosh. Again, darker on the right hand side. This is just water. Okay. So, if I can, I'm going to zoom out. Oh, you keep seeing that horrible half-painted rosette. I'm sorry about that. So there we are. So there it is. It's finished. Um, and I'll also, so that you can see what's going on, I will also show you a picture of the final um, piece. So this is the other sheet of cow parsley that I was talking about that I drew from life and it's got all sorts of bi um, botanical details on it. So the outer flowers have larger petals than the inner flowers and they're zygomorphic which means the petals are different shapes. Some written notes, seed heads, one lower leaf, one upper leaf because they're slightly different structures, a more detailed root so what we just did was a simplified version. Um, making sure that a large lower leaf is included. Seeds, fruit, seed heads. Um, yeah, and on this sheet that we were just looking at, where we just did our habit sketch, we've also got some information on how the leaf attaches to the stem and the fact that the stem is slightly hairy and ho is hollow and this base of rosette is what it looks like in the early spring. So there you are. Well, thank you very much for sticking with me um, and for watching me paint the cow parsley i hope it was useful seeing me do this habit sketch if you'd like to see more of my work please do feel free to visit ww well, i don't need to say that do i please feel free to visit lizzieharper.co.uk where a lot of my originals are for sale and there are step-by-step -step blogs um oh you know and there's loads and loads of galleries of images that i've done but for now thank you very much um and thank you for your time do feel free to like and subscribe and yeah, see you next time. Bye.